Welcome once again to another installment of Adventures in Aberrant Psychology. My chance to dish on what goes on when you deal with the crazy people in your neighborhood. Um, so last night I watched a bunch of SI people and I watched people get placed left and right. By getting placed, I mean a facility that takes their particular type of suicidal ideation was found. There are institutions that specialize in women's issues, like they're suicidal because of domestic violence. There are places that specialize in eating disorders as, you know, a, a part of suicidal ideation. <clears throat> there are places that specialize in just men. There are places that take anything that is cupcake, anything that isn't too hard. Um, there are places that have ICUs, you know, and they're connected to a hospital, and those are a little bit harder to find placement in. But no matter where someone finds placement, be it a detox facility or uh, a rehab, whatnot, it, it takes time, and I was amazed by how many people I watched in one day. They just kept coming and going. It was a very busy day. <clears throat> Most of them were just plain vanilla SI to me. Any more, th they're, they're not worthy of talking about in a video. I feel like we've covered that, and it's getting old to me. Whereas in their lives, it's probably like the most important day of their life is the day that they almost died because of themselves. You know, at least at that point, you know, it's it's really important to them, but it's becoming kind of routine to me. <clears throat> what isn't routine is one particular patient that I had who was 12 years old and had no parents in the facility. And normally, if someone's underage, their parents are there because you can't just take your kid to the emergency room, drop them off, and leave. <clears throat> this, this child was on an M1 hold, so he was not free to leave. And sometimes, a, a kid who's on an M1 hold, who has been there for a week, because they can't find placement, because no place likes to take kids, sometimes the parents will go home, you know, cook some food that's good, and do some laundry, and come back. This kid hadn't seen his mother who brought him in in two days. Twelve years old. But it wasn't really phasing him because he was low-functioning autistic. And by that I mean wearing a diaper. Autistic. And not speaking. He had a um a tablet-like device with a very large battery that had pictures on it and when he wanted to say things he had to push the pictures because he couldn't speak properly. Um, most of what he did was giggle and laugh. Uh, his mother did call in and ask if he was having a manic episode and we said, well, he seems happy. 
And she's like, well, that's, that's the mania, you know. And we don't know the dynamic between him and his mom because we don't see it because she's not there. But he seemed to be just really, really happy. And sometimes he would squeal. And it was annoying, but I let it go because he's autistic, you know. I imagine his mother had to put up with it for years, and it was grinding, and she needed a break. But what I learned from uh, nurses who had been on him, on his case, for a couple shifts, um, they told me that no, she was dropping him off, and she wasn't coming back because she had decided that she just could not take it anymore. And I don't know what mental health or other health problems this woman may have had that she might have been getting treatment for at the same time, but whatever was going on with her, it was bad enough that she decided to give up her child, forcing the child into the system through the emergency room. <clears throat> now she couldn't be charged with abandonment. This is a, a weird part of the law because the child was placed on an M1 hold. And that means the child can't leave the hospital and that doesn't mean that the parent can't leave and the parent is leaving the child at a hospital where they know that the, the child will be cared for, you know. So it's a weird thing that you can abandon your kid, you know, in, in a place like that and, and not be arrested. At one point in the night, uh, he decided to take off his diaper and play with what was in his diaper. This is not an exaggeration. This is what actually happened. And he was still giggly and laughing, and it was tough for me to deal with because I was really afraid that he might fling the diaper. Thankfully, that didn't happen. We got it away from him. We got him to the restroom. Later on in the night, a first for me um, as a behaviorist, um, someone in, in the emergency room doing this that wasn't in a, a long-term facility. Um, <clears throat> for, first, he stood on his uh, bed trying to close the curtains all the way because it was very difficult for him to close the curtains all the way so he wanted to reach up high to get to it and so we we got him down from there because you know there's cameras in the room he doesn't realize it but you know we re as soon as we saw him stand up on the bed we had to go in and and, and tell him to get down and as soon as I I opened the curtain he got down back in bed and and pulled his covers over him. Like, hee 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 So I, I, I pulled them all the way shut because I didn't want him tempted to stand on the bed anymore. About ten minutes later, I'm looking at him in bed and he rolls over in a very weird position. The uh, roasted pig position belly down on the bed. He's under his covers, but his, his head's out. And the way that his neck was cricked back, I thought, you know, that can't be a very comfortable position to sleep in. You know? And then I saw his elbow moving. And I knew what he was doing. And I had to stop him. 
I wasn't the first in the room when, when uh, we stopped him because I was still in mid sentence. Like, is is he? Oh my goodness, no! And then the EMT got into the room before I did. And it, it's... I can imagine if someone stopped me in the middle of doing that, I would be kind of, you know, out of it, jilted, you know? Like, uh, I don't want anyone walking in on me. And he's 12, and he had that happen to him in an emergency room setting. And he was kind of sad for the rest of the night. Um, and sleepy, and he went to sleep. And when I finally left him, it had been three days that he'd been in an emergency room, abandoned. Legally. No place wanted him. No facility that was being called. And there were people calling round the clock to different facilities. They were having a very hard time finding one that would take him. There were CPS workers looking. Not looking to punish the mom. Um, but they were looking for a placement for him and just not finding him. And for all I know, he's still there. I did have another case of autism in the past week. But this other case that I, I experienced, he was high-functioning autism. And he had the demeanor of a YouTuber that I like uh, watching named Napalm. He had facial gestures and, and, and he had a beard, he had long hair, and you know, he just reminded me of Napalm. And he was always kind of ticked off about everything, especially people touching him. You know, nurses wanting to poke and prod him. <clears throat> and if you have Napalm's face in, you, in your mind as you're imagining this, you're not far off. The difference, though, is that this autistic kid, who was almost an adult, weighed 800 pounds. Just to clarify, autistic kid almost 18, not quite, and 800 pounds. And some of my co-workers said, well, maybe he's he's got uh, a hormone thing that's off, you know. And I'm thinking, no. No. This was a case of this kid pitches a fit when he doesn't get what he wants, and then he gets it. And after a while, the parents were just pacifying him with food in order to keep him from having a fit. And they kept doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and giving him what he wanted. And now he's 800 pounds. And I'm not exaggerating when I say 800 pounds. When he wanted to go to the bathroom, he tried to slide down to the edge of his hospital bed in order to get up out of it. You know, the gurney-style beds that are in the emergency room. With his butt on the end of the bed, the head portion of the bed tilted up and the bottom portion hit the ground like someone on a teeter-totter, a seesaw, 
getting off before their seesaw partner gets off. And he made a loud crash, and I'm sure it was very embarrassing for him. Okay? He was huge. And he didn't get that way on his own. He's autistic. Someone's caring for him in a very uncaring way and giving him everything he needed to eat his way to 800 pounds. I'm pretty sure people outside of America who are watching this video don't even believe it when I say 800 pounds. Okay, but this guy's arms were bigger around than my head, okay? Huge guy. And in my mind, there was a different type of neglect and abandonment that was going on there. You know, the, the pacifying him with food had gotten to such a horrible point because they didn't care anymore. They just wanted to get rid of the fits. Make it stop. And then they stopped trying, and that's what happened. The reason why he was in there was because of suicidal ideation. It wasn't because of his weight. He wasn't being seen for weight-related issues. He was suicidal because he was overweight. And he kept saying things like, I'm out of gas. I just don't have any more energy. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this life. And I, I just couldn't help but think, how did he get there? last one I'll share with you, the last story I'll share with you today, um, it, it might even make the news, might be able to look it up. Um, the patient that I was seeing was on a hold, but uh, was not going anywhere because her legs were broken, um, mostly around the ankles, and it was because she tried to climb out of the fourth floor window of a sleep-in off of I-25. Um, and that this is why I think it'll, it'll be news. Um, she tied sheets together because the police were knocking on the front door and her and her boyfriend, I guess, had warrants. And so they tied sheets together. They had enough time before they knocked the door down to tie sheets together uh, to try to make a rope and go out the window. And the boyfriend actually um, made it out the window, down the sheets, and then down to the ground and ran away. And he was not caught by the police that day. Problem with the sheets, though. They did not have enough to make it to the ground. They were more than a story short. And the police took pictures, and I'm sure, you know, reporters on the scene also were intrigued because, you know, lots of witnesses. It was a hotel out in, you know, 
the open where people can see and look out from their windows and stuff. So, yeah, when she tried to jump from where the end of the sheets were, and, and really, do any of you know anyone who is on meth who has enough arm strength to be able to pull off something like that without fucking it up, you know? Um, her and her boyfriend, I guess, were on a meth binge, and I've heard that there are many hotels in the area that are also well known for meth binges and, and whatnot. But I watched her for a while. I'm 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 beginning to collect, uh, basically a bookmarked links to stories on my Chrome account to <clears throat> basically commemorate all of the semi-famous stupid people that I've had to watch. They've had their fifteen minutes of infamy. They've had a little bit more than I've had in my life, but I wouldn't want it at that sort of expense. Till next time, people. Um, don't believe shit that you see in the movies will work, like tying sheets together to get out of a window. <laughs>